ability to determine whether it's helping you or not is very tough. It's similar to this iceberg analogy, right? You've probably heard things like this before where really, you know, that there's things easy to figure out, right? It's easy to figure out how many people have replied to me or read my post or have clicked that they like my page, right? Those are the things that are above the surface. But it's the stuff that are be that's below the surface that really requires you to get in and get your elbows a little dirty and, and frankly work with um, some folks that have some technical ex expertise to understand how it could be benefit benefiting your business. In the sake of time, I'm in a hurry. We talked about social's ability to uh, contribute to the, to the business across many different uh, aspects of the business. Um, so let's talk about the, the, the value. But first, at a high level, what's the value of a social follower? Those of you that have wondered, do these followers that are following my brand, do they mean anything? So I think it was great that uh, Bain actually did, for those of you that are familiar with, uh, with Bain and Bain Capital, they did a study about the value of social media. To understand the real value that social brings, if you have, a, if you have somebody that's chosen to follow your brand on Facebook or Twitter or others, what does that mean for you? They found that when it came to purchase intent, that there was a 60% greater purchase intent because they chose to follow your brand. That's big. They also found that when those customers actually did spend money, those that followed your brand, they spent about 40% more than the average customer. They also found that in terms of their commitment to your brand, that they, in terms of, uh, you know, this, this measurement called net promoter score, which is effectively measuring how much, how much, how committed your customers are to you. They found that they're about 33%, they have about a 33% greater emotional commitment. Okay, so that's helpful. That gives you an idea of, of what, uh, what that could potentially mean for you by having people follow your brand. Um, at Adobe, we're looking at some of those things, but we're looking um, at, at, I think, an even deeper level. So we do track the really high level stuff. We want to know how many people are following us. In fact, we take the, the cumulative look of all of the followers across all of the social networks. And our CMO, our chief marketing officer, likes to refer to that as our social marketable universe. If we were to try to market to everybody that follows us in social, how many people is that? And we, we're tracking at about 22 to 23 million people that are choosing to follow us and we're hoping that the main research is right, right? But we know, we don't, just, we don't just hope, we actually have some, some data points behind that. We're also monitoring how many conversations there are about us. You talk about big data, that's a big trend right now, you hear that in the marketplace. Social produces great volumes of data. Every day there are 60,000 mentions of our Adobe brands in social. But we go beyond that. We've been able to understand that social's ability to impact the bottom line uh, we know that for people that want to buy our Creative Cloud, we can, we can see that 18% of people who buy our Creative Cloud have been influenced by social. And for all of you who've said, you know, you know social media, it's, it's all about business to consumers. It's a consumer play. I run a B2B business. It doesn't apply to me. Our surprising find was that it was more applicable to B2Bs than it was to a business to consumer business. 22% of our leads for our digital marketing solutions, 22% of those B2B solutions of those leads came from social or were influenced by social along the way. And I mentioned our, our ability to reduce call center volume. So this is how I would ask you to look at this. I realize that not everyone here is going to have access to these, these big enterprise class analytics tools like Adobe, Adobe Analytics, right? But many of you maybe, you could raise your hand, how many of you are using a tool like a Google Analytics? A free tool. A lot of you, all right? Even with these free tools, you can go in and you can understand the attribution that social plays in your business. One of the things that we had to go and sit down with our, we had to go in and sit down with our marketing insights organization. This is a bunch of econometrics guys. These are PhDs, that, that uh, have, have lived in the world of marketing and applied their science to it. And they have focused so much on, all they wanted to know was, when somebody bought from me online, did they start, did, did it, where, was, where was the first place that they came into the purchase path and what was the last place? 
And they didn't really, anything in between, they just said, yeah, we don't really care about. All we care about is last click to the buy or the first click that got them into the process. And we sat them down and we said, you know what? That doesn't work for social media. We think social media plays a real great value, but it's generally not at the end. In fact, only four to six percent of our sales come from a last click from social media to end up be, uh, actually buying. But those, those statistics of 18% and 22%, that comes because we started to look at the value in the, uh, once people actually came into the purchase path. Once we could start to track what they were looking at online, we, we began to see that if we, if we tracked social along the way, that those prospects where social appeared in the purchase path, as we tracked their cookies, their online cookies, they were twice as likely to convert than people who, became, who ultimately did not have social as something that they were interacting with with our brand along the way. So that may sound good, but I wanna, I wanna flip it for you because the corollary I think is equally as important. That means that for people who have not had a social engagement with us, they were half as likely to buy than those people who did. That's important. That is, that is some really legitimate ROI kind of stuff. We took that to our chief marketing officer and she was like, this is fantastic. And then it was one of those like, here, have some more money. Like, you know, <laughs> here's budget. This is great. Go do more social, right? So it, it really important. And again, whether you're using an Adobe Analytics solution, whether you're using a, a free tool like Google, and I'd probably get fired, but I figured I wanted to tell you guys our free solutions for you, right? Even though it's competitive to ours. All right, another important area is content creation. It's this idea if you want to be in the media, well maybe you need to become the media. Maybe you need to stop relying so much on, and I, I'm going to say it, I apologize, your advertisement's done. I want that paper to do well, I'm just saying. Maybe, maybe we need to stop relying so much on the media and become the media ourselves. Now, a couple ways you can do that. You could go out and say, well, we're going to actually hire a journalist to come in and create all this really great engaging content. Well, that's probably not very likely for you here, right? So what about finding the people in your business, and maybe it's you yourself. You're the expert at what you do. Maybe you run a roofing business, and you understand the ins and outs of roofing better than anybody in the valley, and you know that. You are, you are a leader in that. But are you a thought leader? Do people, in the, do people in the valley turn to you and say, I want to understand what he's talking about in terms of, or what she's talking about in terms of, of roofs and like the right materials, the right time of year to do it and become a sort of a leader in that and not always be talking about things that are promoting your business. So at Adobe, we've done this. We, we have several different places on, on our site where we're focused on creating content that is completely vendor neutral. We don't promote our products at all. We do all these tips articles. We give them insights on how to do their marketing. Produce a lot of content. 900 pieces of content in the past year for just our digital marketing business. But what was great is we started to do this and suddenly the media started to turn to us. The media started to come back to us and say, you know what, that's kind of cool. Wall Street Journal last week picked up one of our stories. They ran a story. We were trying to tell people about when the best time was to buy gifts. We have the insight. We have the data. We're a leader in that space, so we just write about it. Wall Street Journal picks it up. Harvard Business Review picks it up. We have a lot of these kinds of relationships that are now building from the fact that we decided we're not going to rely on the media. We're going to become the media ourselves. 900 articles that we've written in the past year for digital marketing, uh, for, for digital marketers. 60,000 shares across social, two, two million visits to our solution pages came from that. Uh, uh, they're, they're twice as likely to convert, and of our leads, we look at what our lead, the, the business leads that we have, what have they ultimately looked at or been, uh, had as part of their purchase path? 30% of them have consumed content from that. So then you come, and, and again, it's, we've talked about a lot of stuff and how Adobe has done it, and some of that is really applicable to what you do. But let's talk more specifically about, I'm a small business. What do I need to do? How do I connect with my customers? So here are a few questions I wanna, I wanna give you, three more slides here. Questions to ask, do's and don'ts, as a small business, all right? So questions to ask. 
how is my business thinking about moments in time, both locally and nationally? So these are things like, hey, Swiss days, what, what am I doing through my business to support that? And it's not just ads. Maybe, how am I doing maybe act, you know, some sort of an on-the-ground activation? How am I using social media to connect with the people that are there? Ryan's here, and I've got ice castles up here. I think that that impacted many businesses last winter in a time that's traditionally slow. How can you take advantage of the fact that that's happening during a, a traditionally slow time of year? What about a national event like Giving Tuesday that's coming up? It's the, you go, you go uh, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and then for those of you that have been following this, Tuesday is now referred to as Giving Tuesday. How are you supporting that or other events that are like that or that are focused on doing good in the world? The millennial generation and generation X and Y, they care about businesses that are doing good to their communities. And that means a great deal to them. Am I giving my customers voice and am I considering their feedback? Or, or am all I doing is just pushing through a megaphone my message? And do I care nothing about what they say in return? How can I use social media to help do good in the community? How can I try to pull together maybe like-minded businesses and try to do some cool social campaign that's focused on improving things in Heber and doing, using social as a way to do that and getting the, the younger generation to be a part of that? The brand will see great value from that. And I wonder, would businesses in the Valley consider some sort of a social community consortium? Could you actually get together as a, as a group of businesses and start to talk to each other about how can we help each other out this world of social is not easy. What if we were to try to get together and try to help each other out, promote each other's posts, retweet, comment, start to get more involved with each other's posts? All right, so some additional do's. I've given a bunch of do's based on our experience, but for the small business. Be aware of Facebook's bait and switch. I don't know how many of you guys were, how many of you are aware of the fact that Facebook pulled a, they pulled a fast one on businesses uh, in the last couple of years. It used to be that if I chose to follow Heber Valley Bank, I'm going to use that because my dad used to work there. If I used to follow Heber Valley Bank on Facebook and they posted, I would see it because I chose to follow them and I would see it no matter what as long as it was in my, as long as I was looking at Facebook. Well, Facebook pulled the quick one on us. They decided that they'd built this huge audience and they needed to get some revenue because now they're a public business. So now they say, if you want to have your posts, businesses, if you want to have your posts seen by the people who've already chosen to follow you, you got to pay us money. And if you don't, well, then you're going to have to be subject to the Google, uh, sorry, to the Facebook algorithm, which will, it's going to select which posts go on which people's pages. And if you're like us, you're furious about that. Because we went suddenly, we dropped uh, from about 60% of people who were seeing our posts to 20 to 30% of people seeing our posts. That's big. If you're relying on Facebook, that hurts. So be aware of their bait and switch. And it makes, it, it rings true, this, this point I made earlier drives it home even more. You've got to be social network agnostic. If your life depends, if your social networking marketing plan depends on Facebook, that hurt even more. Focus on your business objectives, not on the network. Additional dues, become a thought leader. We talked about this, by showcasing your expertise online. Consider starting a blog. Consider an Instagram account or in your Facebook or Twitter accounts. Do things that are more focused on sharing your expertise as opposed to pitching your product or service. Create content that's useful, not just promotional. Remember that stat I gave? 86% of people prefer a useful brand be useful. Try to figure out a way to tie your virtual world to the physical world with engaging these, these sort of fun, real world activations that ultimately are going to encourage people to share online. So I, I think what Ryan Davis has done with Ice Castles is the perfect example with the, of this, and I know that is the business, but that is inherently something that's going to create buzz. Who doesn't want to have a picture next to these really cool ice castles that have all these beautiful lights by them? I mean, Instagram last winter, my Instagram feed and Facebook feed were just covered with people that were at the ice castles. What can you do to try to create something that is 
maybe not, in, in, it doesn't start out as inherently social, but builds buzz because of the fact that it's cool and it's something that's real world. Be visual. That ties into the previous one. But did you know that 87% of all of the interactions on Facebook are video or photos? And 35%, you get 35% more retweets if you're on Twitter if you're posting a picture or a video than if you didn't. So make sure you're not just text <laughs> posting, but you're thinking about ways that you can uh, tie visual components into your social posts. 